Hello, and welcome to the nuclear reactor at the University of New Mexico. I'm Carl Willis, the chief reactor supervisor for this facility. This is a very special reactor with a fascinating history. It was born in 1957 as part of a fleet of small, portable, mass-produced nuclear reactors made by the Aerojet General Nucleonics Corporation of San Ramon, California. AGN had the idea that there was a market for a mass-produced nuclear reactor. And to put this in context, we have to remember that in the mid-1950s, there was a lot of enthusiasm and excitement and optimism about the role of nuclear technology. And out of that milieu, AGN produced and sold about 20 of these AGN-201 type nuclear reactors. Serial number 112 came to the University of New Mexico in 1966 from the University of California. It first went critical in October of 1966 at UNM, um, but it had a life before that for about a decade at UC Berkeley. So when it came to UNM, it was not in this location originally. It arrived here and, and uh, attained first criticality in this laboratory in uh, uh, April of 1969. This reactor is an extremely low power system licensed for only five watts. That's, uh, that's five watts of thermal power. I should be clear, we don't generate electricity at this facility, we're not a nuclear power plant. So this reactor originally sold for about $95,000, inclusive of the nuclear fuel lease, as well as installation. So AGN would send out reps to help install the reactor, and you would have your fuel lease from the Atomic Energy Commission. And in today's money, that comes in at about a million dollars. We could not do this today, and in fact, nobody else is putting together these little tiny reactors. Of the original fleet of about 20 of the AGN-201 type reactors, that were installed in the United States. As of 2020, there are two that remain in operational condition, and we are the proud owners of one of those. The purpose of this reactor is exclusively teaching and training. We have student reactor operators who become licensed in that role by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The NRC sends out an examiner, and the student can take the written portions of the test and then can operate the reactor and demonstrate that they can effectively and safely control it. So this reactor right here looks from, from your vantage point like just a big old block of red concrete. The actual reactor core is very small. And in fact, a person can hold the core in their hands. Let me show you. This is the size of the core of the AGN-201M nuclear reactor. And sort of like a Russian nesting doll, it is surrounded by various layers of neutron reflecting and radiation shielding materials. So uh, the core is actually surrounded by a graphite neutron reflector, and outside of that is lead, which is used as a gamma or photon shield. Outside of the lead is a 1,000 gallon tank of water which mostly shields neutrons. And then finally, we have the additional shielding provided by the solid concrete uh, wall there. So it's not concrete cinder blocks that we're familiar with from like home construction and so forth. These are solid concrete blocks. And because of the added shielding around this reactor, it is better shielded than the original AGN configuration and is able to support higher power operation. Physics-wise, this reactor has a lot in common with the so-called water boiler aqueous homogeneous reactors that were built by Enrico Fermi and his associates at Los Alamos in the 1940s. So a homogeneous reactor has an, a, a uniform mixture of the fuel material and a moderator. So in our case, the fuel material is uranium dioxide that's enriched to just below 20% U-235 and our moderator is polyethylene plastic. We have about 700 grams of U-235 in this system. 
We've got control rods that enter from the bottom. And if you come around on this side, you can see where the control rods enter. If you're pretending this is the bottom of the reactor core, they insert this way. And there are three large ones, two safety rods and a coarse control rod. And we also have a fine control rod that is nominally one quarter the worth of the large rods. And because these insert from the bottom, if there's a power outage or a mechanism failure of any kind, gravity will assist in removing those rods from the core. The core is supported through a center rod that passes through this hole here. And in the event of a power excursion, a thermal fuse, which is a piece of high density plastic fuel at the center of the reactor will melt and the bottom pieces of this core will fall under gravity and take the core deeply subcritical. So we have a safety mechanism to avoid power excursions in the AGN-201M. Coming around to the side, we have a hole that runs diametrically through the very middle of the reactor that is conveniently named the glory hole. And this terminology dates from the early water boilers at Los Alamos. It's a coinage of Enrico Fermi, who probably brought it from the glass blowers of Venice. A lot of the fun bits of this reactor are down beneath it because that's where the control rod drives are located. So let's go take a look. This is underneath our reactor. We can see the tank drain valve for the, uh, the water tank. We can also see the junction uh, area for all the cables coming from the console where they uh, are connected to the cables that then go over to our control rod drive mechanisms. And the control rods are up under that little shell and we'll pull those off in just a sec and show you what's in there. So down here under the reactor, we have our safety rod number one, our safety rod number two, our coarse control rod, and our fine rod. And the three big rods all have dash pots for when they're dropped out of the core. Our fine rod doesn't have one of those other features at the bottom here, we have a seismic sensor, which is just a little ball that sits on contacts. If we have an earthquake, that ball jumps off those contacts and we scram. We have a temperature sensor. So with this type of reactor with a negative temperature coefficient, it's important that we not get too cold. And our temperature sensor measures the bulk temperature or the temperature of all of the water that is stored in the thousand gallon tank right over my head. So the value of this is it keeps us from having a having too much reactivity if we're too cold. We've got our instrumentation cables. These all come from detectors that are located outside of the core but close to it and these cables run to the top of the reactor uh, and then back down into tubes where the detectors are actually located. But they come down through this feed through in the water tank down beneath the reactor and then um, we can, uh, and then they pass through the uh, cable tray that goes over to the console. So here's our, all of our terminal blocks for instrumentation that attaches beneath the reactor which is to say our control rods and um, our, uh, our earthquake sensor and uh, temperature sensor. And um, so that's what we got down here. If I look up, I can see the 1,000 gallon water tank to my left. That's this guy right here. 
and we see access ports. This is where people can put things into the reactor. We have four of them and they pass through close to the core and are accessible on each side the north and the south side of the reactor. And coming back around this way, that's where the cables go off to the console. Okay, here we're looking at our access ports. And we can see there, there's access port three and access port four four closest to us. If we scan around to the side, here's our water tank. And then way back over here, this is the other side of the glory hole. And right above it is the original nameplate for our reactor. And let me see, I don't know if I can quite get in there. Yeah, that's tricky, man. Let's see if we can get in there some more. So we're going to perform a reactor startup, and uh, Rowdy is, uh, the, the first thing we have to do is um, prepare the reactor. So we've done a, uh, we've done a check out of the physical systems and the uh, radiation survey, and now we need to remove that uh, $10 of negative reactivity from the glory holes. Every reactor operation here begins with a set of logs to make sure that the neutron measuring equipment is working appropriately and that the uh, control rods uh, and their interlocks and drive mechanisms are working appropriately. We also check the reactor temperature. We have a negative temperature coefficient of reactivity, so the temperature has to be high enough in order to operate this reactor. Currently, we're going to insert the control rods in a sequence. We'll start by inserting safety rod one and then safety rod two, followed by the coarse and fine control rods. And the 
Safety rods by themselves are insufficient to make the reactor critical. Um, a combination of coarse and fine control rod insertions will take the reactor to a supercritical state. And then we're going to raise the power. We're going to go up almost to our license power. We'll go up to about 4.8 watts today. And uh, then we're going to reduce power. We'll come back to about one watt. And during this, uh, we will look at the positioning of the coarse and fine rod. And what I aim to demonstrate is that criticality does not depend on power level. And the critical positions of these rods do not depend on power level. So unlike the throttle in an automobile, for instance, higher power is not associated with having the rods in a more inserted position. So we're seeing a rise in neutron population on the screen from the auxiliary detector. This is due to subcritical multiplication as our reactivity from our safety rods is added. So safety rods one and two are now fully in. The lights are illuminated. And at this point, another set of logs will be taken and compared to the readings uh, taken in the previous operation. We're good to go up with power. Excellent. Okay. 4.8 watts? 4.8. Okay. Driving. All rods are now fully inserted. And reactor power is rising. We're extracting the startup neutron source. We're now passing about 20 milliwatts. Our period, or e-folding time, is currently about 25 seconds. Neutron growth in a supercritical reactor is exponential. We're now passing 100 milliwatts, one-tenth of a watt.
So it'll take the same amount of time to get from one tenth of a watt to one watt as it would take to get from one watt to 10 watts, which of course is in excess of our license power limit. So uh, the operator needs to be kind of uh, quick on his feet or on his hands, as it were, as soon as the uh, desired power level is reached. So we're now passing 500 milliwatts, half a watt. Another way to express uh, exponential growth is to uh, look at the base two folding time, uh, or the doubling time as it's called. And right now that stands at about 17 seconds. We've just passed one watt. Again, this is one watt thermal. We do not generate any electricity. This is not a nuclear power plant here. Two watts. So because the doubling time is about 17 seconds, we will reach rated power uh, in probably about 10 seconds. There are two control modes for each of the coarse and fine control rods in the reactor. They can be operated in a fast drive mode or a slow drive mode. And Rowdy has just engaged the slow drive modes for both as we are making small adjustments um, as we approach the desired power level. As soon as we stabilize at 4.8 watts, we'll make a record of that in the reactor log. Okay, we have established criticality, and our rod positions are 16.26 centimeters on the fine rod and 21.58 centimeters on the coarse rod.
the operator is now looking at our radiation detectors that show what radiation levels are like in the in various places around our facility, including the laboratory, outside of the reactor room, the reactor top, the console where he is sitting right now, and checkpoint three, which is on the south side of the reactor. And the reactor top is currently about 100 millirentgens per hour, which constitutes a high radiation area, hence a sign that is posted on the stairs to the top of the reactor. We also see about looks like two, one to two millirentgens per hour at the console. So our operator is safe. All right, readings are done. Okay, so we are now going to attain criticality again at one watt. So we see reactor power falling, but it does not fall immediately. All reactors have delayed neutron precursors, which are fission products that emit neutrons, decay with the radioactive emission of a neutron. And these are extremely important in the kinetics and control of nuclear reactors. If those didn't exist, the reactor's response time would be impossible uh, to, it would be impossible to control the reactor on a human time scale. So delayed neutron precursors are extremely important, even though only a very small fraction of neutrons are emitted as delayed neutrons.
We now look pretty well established at one watt. And we will take another critical reading. Right, and now for the fun part, shutting the reactor down, we are going to perform a manual scram and drop all of the rods out of the reactor by gravity. All right, let's have a manual scram. Notice looking at the looking at the neutron power, we see that it does not drop immediately, but there is a significant amount of power still being produced, even when we're deeply subcritical after shutting down. And this is due to those delayed neutron precursors that are still decaying. Typical models account for six groups of delayed neutron precursors, all characterized by different half-lives. And so what we're seeing is a complex exponential decay modified by subcritical multiplication of those neutrons in the subcritical core. Neutron source is being reinserted. All rods are down. Cadmium is inserted. We're going to now go retrieve that GoPro that we left down here, and we are about to enter a posted radiation area, so we're carrying a Geiger counter with us. radiation detector down here is showing two millirentgens per hour in the wake of that operation. <laughs> 